Johann Philipp Rice, German, Ass, January 7, 1834 to January 14, 1874, was a self-taught German scientist and inventor. In 1861, he constructed the first make and break telephone, today called the Rice telephone. Topic: Early life and education. Rice was born in Gelnhausen, Germany, the son of Marie Catherine Glockner and Karl Sigismund Rice, a master baker. His father belonged to the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Rice's mother died while he was an infant, and he was raised by his paternal grandmother, a well-read, intelligent woman. At the age of six Rice was sent to the common school of his hometown of Gelnhausen. Here his talents attracted the notice of his instructors, who advised his father to extend his education at a higher college. His father died before Rice was ten years old. His grandmother and guardians placed him at Garnier's Institute, in Friedrichsdorf, where he showed a taste for languages, and acquired both French and English, as well as a stock of miscellaneous information from the library. At the end of his fourteenth year, Rice was accepted to a Hassel Institute, at Frankfurt am Main, where he learned Latin and Italian. A love of science became apparent, and his guardians were recommended to send him to the Polytechnic School of Karlsruhe. His uncle wished him to become a merchant, and on March 1, 1850, Rice was apprenticed as a paints dealer in the establishment of J. F. Bayerbach, of Frankfurt, against his will. He told his uncle that he would learn the business chosen for him, but would continue his preferred studies as he could. By diligent service, he won the esteem of Bayerbach and devoted his leisure to self improvement, taking private lessons in mathematics and physics and attending the lectures of Professor R. Botka on mechanics at the trade school. When his apprenticeship ended, Rice attended the Institute of Dr. Popper, in Frankfurt. As neither history nor geography was taught there, several of the students agreed to instruct each other in these subjects. Rice undertook geography, and believed he had found his true vocation in the art of teaching. He also became a member of the Physical Society of Frankfurt. In 1855, he completed his year of military service at Kassel, then returned to Frankfurt to qualify as a teacher of mathematics and science by means of private study and public lectures. His intention was to finish his training at the University of Heidelberg, but in the spring of 1858 he visited his old friend and master, Hofrath Garnier, who offered him a post in Garnier's Institute. On 14 September 1859, Rice married, and shortly after he moved to Friedrichsdorf, to begin his new career as a teacher. Topic: The telephone. Rice imagined electricity could be propagated through space, as light can, without the aid of a material conductor, and he performed some experiments on the subject. The results were described in a paper on the radiation of electricity, which, in 1859 he mailed to Professor Poggendorf for insertion in the then well-known periodical, Annalen der Physik. The manuscript was rejected, to the great disappointment of the sensitive young teacher, Rice, like Bell would later do, had studied the organs of ear and the idea of an apparatus for transmitting sound by means of electricity had floated on his mind for years. Inspired by his physics lessons he attacked the problem, and was rewarded with success. In 1860, he constructed the first prototype of a telephone, which could cover a distance of 100 meters. In 1862, he again tried to interest Poggendorf with an account of his 
telephone, as he called it. His second offering was also rejected, like the first. The learned professor, it seems, regarded the transmission of speech by electricity as a chimera. Rice bitterly attributed the failure to his being only a poor schoolmaster. Rice had difficulty interesting people in Germany in his invention despite demonstrating it to, among others, Wilhelm von Leggett, inspector of the Royal Prussian Telegraph Corps in 1862. It aroused more interest in the United States in 1872, when Professor van der Wither demonstrated it in New York. Prior to 1947, the Rice device was tested by the British company Standard Telephones and Cables STC. The results also confirmed it could faintly transmit and receive speech. At the time STC was bidding for a contract with Alexander Graham Bell's American Telephone and Telegraph Company, and the results were covered up by STC's chairman Sir Frank Gill to maintain Bell's reputation. <laughs> Previous experimenters Since the invention of the telephone, attention has been called to the fact that, in 1854, M. Charles Bourseul, a French telegraphist, had conceived a plan for conveying sounds and even speech by electricity. Suppose that a man speaks near a movable disc sufficiently flexible to lose none of the vibrations of the voice, that this disc alternately makes and breaks the currents from a battery, you may have at a distance another disc which will simultaneously execute the same vibrations. It is certain that, in a more or less distant future, speech will be transmitted by electricity. I have made experiments in this direction, they are delicate and demand time and patience, but the approximations obtained promise a favorable result. Bourseul deserves the credit of being perhaps the first to devise an electric telephone and try to make it, but Rice deserves the honor of first realizing the idea as a device to transmit and receive sounds electrically. Borsa's idea seems to have attracted little notice at the time, and was soon forgotten. Even the Count du Monsel, who was ever ready to welcome a promising invention, evidently regarded it as a fantastic notion. It is very doubtful Rice had ever heard of it. Rice was led to conceive a similar apparatus by a study of the mechanism of the human ear, which he knew contained a membrane which vibrated due to sound waves, and communicated its vibrations through the hammer bone behind it to the auditory nerve. It therefore occurred to him, if he made a diaphragm to imitate this membrane and caused it, by vibrating, to make and break the circuit of an electric current, he would be able through the magnetic power of the interrupted current to reproduce the original sounds at a distance. During 1837–38 Professor Page of Massachusetts had discovered that a needle or thin bar of iron, placed in the hollow of a coil or bobbin of insulated wire, would emit an audible tick at each interruption of a current, flowing in the coil, and if these separate ticks followed each other fast enough, by a rapid interruption of the current, they would run together into a continuous hum, to which he gave the name galvanic music. He also found that the pitch of this note corresponded to the rate of the current's interruption. These faint sounds were due to magnetostriction. From these and other discoveries by Node, Vertime, Marion, and others, Rice knew that if the current which had been interrupted by his vibrating diaphragm were conveyed to a distance by wires and then passed through a coil like that of pages, the iron needle would emit notes like those which had caused the oscillation of the transmitting diaphragm. Acting on this knowledge, he constructed his rudimentary telephone. Rice prototype is now in the Museum of the Reichs Post AMT, Berlin. Topic: 
Topic: Shortcomings. Another of his early transmitters was a rough model of the human ear, carved in oak, and provided with a drum which actuated a bent and pivoted lever of platinum, making it open and close a springy contact of platinum foil in the metallic circuit of the current. He devised some ten or twelve different forms, each an improvement on its predecessors, which transmitted music fairly well, and even a word or two of speech with more or less fidelity. The discovery of the microphone by Professor Hughes has demonstrated the reason of this failure. Rice transmitter was based on interrupting the current, and the spring was intended to close the contact after it had been opened by the shock of a vibration. So long as the sound was a musical tone it proved efficient, for a musical tone is a regular succession of vibrations. The vibrations of speech are irregular and complicated, and in order to transmit them the current has to be varied in strength without being altogether broken. The waves excited in the air by the voice should merely produce corresponding waves in the current. In short, the current ought to undulate in sympathy with the oscillations of the air. The rice phone was poor at transmitting articulated speech, but was able to convey the pitch of the sound. It appears from the report of Herr von Leggett, an inspector with the Royal Prussian Telegraphs, which was published in 1862. Rice was quite aware of this principle, but his instrument was not well adapted to apply it. No doubt the platinum contacts he employed in the transmitter behaved to some extent as a crude metal microphone, and hence a few words, especially familiar or expected ones, could be transmitted and distinguished at the other end of the line. If rice phone was adjusted so the contact points made a loose metallic contact. They would function much like the later telephone invented by Berliner or the Hughes microphone, one form of which had iron nails in loose contact. Thus the rice phone worked best for speech when it was slightly out of adjustment. A history of the telephone from 1910 records that in the course of the Dolbear lawsuit, a rice machine was brought into court, and created much amusement. It was able to squeak, but not to speak. Experts and professors wrestled with it in vain. It refused to transmit one intelligible sentence. It can speak, but it won't, explained one of Dolbear's lawyers. It is now generally known that while a rice machine, when clogged and out of order, would transmit a word or two in an imperfect way, it was built on the wrong lines. It was no more a telephone than a wagon is a sleigh, even though it is possible to chain the wheels and make them slide for a foot or two. Said Judge Lowell, in rendering his famous decision, a century of rice would never have produced a speaking telephone by mere improvement of construction. It was left for Bell to discover that the failure was due not to workmanship but to the principle which was adopted as the basis of what had to be done. Bell discovered a new art that of transmitting speech by electricity, and his claim is not as broad as his invention. To follow Rice is to fail, but to follow Bell is to succeed. Rice does not seem to have realized the importance of not entirely breaking the circuit of the current, at all events, his metal spring was not practical for this, for it allowed the metal contacts to jolt too far apart, and thus interrupt the electric current. His experiments were made in a little workshop behind his home at Friedrichsdorf, and wires were run from it to an upper chamber. 
Another line was erected between the physical cabinet at Garnier's Institute across the playground to one of the classrooms, and there was a tradition in the school that the boys were afraid of creating an uproar in the room for fear that Philip Rice would hear them with his telephone. Publication Rice's new invention was articulated in a lecture before the Physical Society of Frankfurt on 26 October 1861, and a description, written by himself for Jaresbericht a month or two later. It created a good deal of scientific excitement in Germany. Models of it were sent abroad to London, Dublin, Tiflis, and other places. It became a subject for popular lectures and an article for scientific cabinets. Rice obtained brief renown, but rejection soon set in. The Physical Society of Frankfurt turned its back on the apparatus which had given it luster. Rice resigned in 1867, but the Free German Institute of Frankfurt, which elected him as an honorary member, also slighted the instrument as a mere philosophical toy. Rice believed in his invention, even if no one else did, and had he been encouraged by his peers from the beginning he might have perfected it. He was already stricken with tuberculosis, however. After Rice gave a lecture on the telephone at Gein in 1854, Poggendorf, who was present, invited him to send a description of his instrument to the Annalen. Rice, it is said, replied. Ich danke einen sehr, Herr Professor, aber es ist zu spät. Jetzt will ich ihn nicht schicken. Mein Apparat wird ohne Beschreibung in den Annalen bekannt werden. Thank you very much, Professor, but it is too late. Now I do not want to send it. My apparatus will become known without any description in the Annalen. Topic: Final days. Later, Rice continued his teaching and scientific studies, but his failing health had become a serious impediment. For several years, it was only by the exercise of his strong will that he was able to carry on with his duties. His voice began to fail as his lung disease became more pronounced, and in the summer of 1873 he was obliged to forsake his tutoring duties for several weeks. An autumn vacation strengthened his hopes of recovery and he resumed his teaching, but it was to be the last flicker of his expiring flame. It was announced that he would show his new gravity machine at a meeting of the Gesellschaft Deutsche Naturforscher und Arzt Society of German Scientists and Physicians of Wiesbaden in September, but he was too ill to appear. In December he lay down and, after a long and painful illness, died at 5 o'clock in the afternoon of January 14, 1874. In his curriculum vitae he wrote, As I look back upon my life I call indeed say with the holy scriptures that it has been labor and sorrow, but I have also to thank the Lord that he has given me his blessing in my calling and in my family, and has bestowed more good upon me than I have known how to ask of him. The Lord has helped hitherto, he will help yet further. Philip Rice was buried in the cemetery of Friedrichsdorf, and in 1878, after the introduction of the electric telephone, the members of the Physical Society of Frankfurt erected an obelisk of red sandstone bearing a medallion portrait over his grave. Topic recognition and technological assessment In 1878, four years after his death and two years after Bell received his first telephone patent, European scientists dedicated a monument to Philip Rice as the inventor of the telephone. 
Documents of 1947 in London's Science Museum later showed that after their technical adjustments, engineers from the British firm Standard Telephones and Cables (STC) found Rice telephone dating from 1863 could transmit and reproduce speech of good quality but of low efficiency. Sir Frank Gill, then chairman of STC, ordered the tests to be kept secret, as STC was then negotiating with AT&T, which had evolved from the Bell Telephone Company, created by Alexander Graham Bell. Professor Bell was generally accepted as having invented the telephone and Gill thought that evidence to the contrary might disrupt the ongoing negotiations. Topic: Johann Philipp Rice Prize Award. The VDE, the German Electrical Engineering Association, Deutsche Telekom, and the cities of Friedrichsdorf and Gelnhausen biannually present the Johann Philipp Rice Prize Prize to scientists for distinguished scientific achievements in the area of communication technology topic telephone invention controversies besides rice and bell many others claimed to have invented the telephone the result was the Gray Bell telephone controversy, one of the United States' longest running patent interference cases, involving Bell, Thomas Alva Edison, Alicia Gray, Emil Berliner, Amos Dolbear, J. W. McDonough, G. B. Richmond, W. L. Voker, J. H. Irwin, and Francis Blake, Jr. The case started in 1878 and was not finalized until February 27, 1901. Bell and the Bell Telephone Company triumphed in this crucial decision, as well as every one of the over 600 other court decisions related to the invention of the telephone. The Bell Telephone Company never lost a case that had proceeded to a final trial stage. Another controversy arose over a century later when the U.S. Congress passed a resolution in 2002 recognizing Italian American Antonio Mucci's contributions in the invention of the telephone, not for the invention of the telephone, a declaration that bore no legal or other standing at the United States Patent and Trade. Trademark Office USPTO. Canada's Parliament quickly followed with a tit-for-tat declaration, which clarified less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 that Alexander Graham Bell of Brantford, ONT, and Baddock, NS, was the inventor of the telephone. Prior to his death, Mucci had lost his only concluded federal lawsuit trial related to the telephone's invention. See also German inventors and discoverers History of the telephone